name is Stephen Liu from Georgetown University discussing the top lung cancer trials of 2020 with OncoAlert. I think you have to include Adora on that list. Adora was a global, double-blind, placebo-controlled phase three trial for patients with resected lung cancer exploring the role of adjuvant-targeted therapy. Eligible patients for this trial had completely resected stage 1b, 2, or 3a non-small cell lung cancer harboring an activating mutation in EGFR, specifically an exon 19 deletion or an exon 21 L858R point mutation. Patients could receive adjuvant chemotherapy, though they were not required to do so. Brain imaging was part of the preoperative requirements. Patients were randomized one-to-one -one to receive adjuvant osimertinib at 80 milligrams once daily, osimertinib, a third-generation EGFR TKI approved in the stage four setting, randomized osimertinib or placebo for a period of three years with a primary endpoint of disease-free survival in the stage two and three subset. These data were first presented by Dr. Roy Herbst at Virtual Alaska 20. The demographics shown here are as expected, about a 70-30 split female to male, primarily non-smokers. Note 25 to 32% did have a smoking history. A roughly even split between 1B, 2, and 3A. Note that this was using the AJCC 7th edition, not the most recent 8th edition. And 55% of patients received adjuvant chemotherapy though the corollary 45% did not, though there may have been an indication to do so. The data were impressive. The study was overwhelmingly positive. This was not part of a planned interim analysis. This was an unplanned analysis after an independent monitoring committee noted the degree of benefit, the hazard ratio for DFS 0.17, strongly and irrefutably in favor of adjuvant osimertinib. The two-year DFS rate, 90%, Fairly immature with about 22 months follow-up, the control arm did rather poorly, though in line with previous reports in this disease setting, with a 44% DFS rate at two years for patients with potentially curative disease. This forest plot shows the relevant subgroups, osimertinib benefits seen across the board, though somewhat less benefit in the earlier stage 1b subset, the Kaplan-Meier curves shown here, the hazard ratio in 1b 0.50, and the Kaplan-Meier curves do look quite good for both control and experimental arms. However, for stage 2 and 3, we see an early and impressive split in those DFS curves. The hazard ratio for DFS in stage 2, 0.17, in stage 3, 0.12. We walk away from this relatively immature data set knowing that adjuvant osimertinib significantly and undeniably improves disease-free survival in patients with resected stage 2 and 3 EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer with a hazard ratio that looks more like a p-value at 0.17. DFS was the primary endpoint of this phase 3 placebo-controlled trial. There were no concerning safety signals for a relatively well-tolerated drug Based on these data, osimertinib was granted breakthrough designation by the U.S. FDA for use in resected early-stage non-small cell lung cancer. However, there are still questions that remain from Adora. Notably, what is the impact on survival? Or, put another way, is DFS and PFS enough to change practice now in the curative setting? We have some recent precedent for this. If we think back to 2017, for patients with stage 3 unresectable non-small cell lung cancer, the standard treatment was chemoradiation, given concurrently a potentially curative therapy, though patients often suffer relapse after this treatment. The Pacific trial explored the addition of consolidation dervalumab after chemoradiation, and in 2017, we saw these results showing a PFS hazard ratio of 0 0.52, an early split to these curves, and impressive landmark PFS rates. At this time, even though we did not have survival in the curative setting, this was enough to change practice for many people, myself included, based on the poor performance of the control arm, based on the degree, the magnitude of PFS benefit. We expected with more time, this would translate to an OS benefit, and in fact it did. The following year we saw the OS benefit at World Lung 2018. An update from 2020 by Dr. Janelle Gray showed an OS hazard ratio of 0.69. Dervalumab became the standard of care early, and this was validated. It remains our current standard practice. Does this translate to EGFR? It's a bit different. 
If we look at stage four EGFR mutant lung cancer, the optimal trial randomized patients with treatment-naive EGFR positive lung cancer to frontline erlotinib therapy, erlotinib, a first-generation EGFR kinase inhibitor, or chemotherapy. This was overwhelmingly positive in favor of EGFR-targeted therapy with a PFS hazard ratio of 0.16, even lower than what we saw in the DORA, survival curves that split immediately, and that separation widens over time. And yet with more follow-up, despite the magnitude of PFS benefit, the overwhelming head start those patients received there was no OS benefit. The OS hazard ratio 1.19. In the stage four setting, the biology may be different. What do we know about resected EGFR lung cancer? Well, in ASCO 2020, Professor Yi Long Wu presented the adjuvant CTONG trial. This trial showed a PFS benefit with a hazard ratio of 0 0.56. I think these Kaplan Meier curves are very telling. The adjuvant CTONG trial was a different design, randomizing patients to Jafitnib, a first generation EGFR TKI or chemotherapy, not jafitinib after chemotherapy. Patients received jafitinib for two years. If we look at these DFS Kaplan-Meier curves, we see that they split fairly early and that separation is maintained for those first two years. Once the TKI stops, those curves start to come together and by year four, they are overlapping. Despite the improvement in PFS, there was no OS benefit with adjuvant jafitinib. Those Kaplan-Meier curves largely overlap. A hint of separation for the first two years coming together, a five-year survival rate almost identical between the two arms. Improvements in PFS are not guaranteed to translate into an OS improvement, though they sometimes do. The Phase two SELECT trial led by Dr. Nate Pinnell looked at adjuvant erlotinib in EGFR mutant lung cancer for two years, and that two-year DFS rate was 88% fairly similar to the two-year DFS rate in the DORA, which was 90% with osimertinib. But if we look at that DFS curve, we can see that once the TKI therapy stops, that DFS rate drops. The five-year DFS rate in the SELECT trial, only 56%. So the impact on survival is largely unknown. Will that DFS improvement, which is profound, translate to an OS improvement? Or will that DFS rate precipitously drop once we stop that TKI after three years. The benefit we saw was after a median follow-up of only 22 months. Patients are receiving adjuvant osimertinib on the DORA for three years. What happens at year four? What happens at year five? And if those DFS curves come together, do we view this benefit differently? If with more time we do see an OS benefit, will that initial OS benefit fade with time? Will it decrease as we're able to rescue or salvage more patients? Are we curing more patients with adjuvant osimertinib? Or are we simply delaying relapse, suppressing microscopic residual disease? We don't know what the impact of osimertinib is on relapse. Will three years of a kinase inhibitor exert a selective pressure and select for a more resistant clone at the time of relapse, uh, threatening long-term outcomes? I think this is unlikely, but something we have to consider. Will adjuvant kinase inhibitors impact relapse patterns? Will we delay CNS relapse, which can be a devastating side of relapse for many patients? I think most importantly, is there a means to identify those patients who relapse on the placebo arm but would not relapse with adjuvant osimertinib? This is likely where our efforts are best focused. Is there a potential role here for plasma testing, for detecting minimal residual disease, delivering therapy where it's needed? And in those patients, is three years really an adequate time for treatment? Or is there a predictive genomic signature in the tissue that can tell us who is destined for relapse and who is not? For patients with microscopic disease, for high-risk patients, is three years the appropriate duration? Is four, is five, is indefinite therapy more appropriate? What is the contribution of cytotoxic chemotherapy in this setting? Is it necessary? Does it add? Or can it be eliminated? Adora not designed to answer that question, but this will be a question asked by many patients and oncologists alike. Is there still a role for post-operative radiation therapy? Many oncologists, myself included, still employ port therapy for patients with resected N2 disease. And what impact will this have on molecular testing? Will we revert to single gene testing for EGFR? Will we move NGS up front, though this comes at notable cost? Will this improve screening and testing for molecular alterations overall, allowing more patients who would relapse in the future to have their molecular data ready? 
or will we struggle in the early stage setting as we've struggled in the stage four setting? Does this strategy of adjuvant targeted therapy hold true for other drivers? What about someone with a resected stage three ALK positive lung cancer or ROS1 or NTRAC? Is the same strategy in place? A phase three trial for resected NTRAC positive lung cancer largely impossible to do. And does this hold true after chemo radiation? Should we be using Durvalumab with, uh, in, in some aspects, somewhat questionable benefit for driver positive lung cancer? Or should we extrapolate? The LORA trial will examine this question. It'll be years before we get that answer. What do we do now? From Adora, there is an undeniable DFS benefit with a hazard ratio of 0 0.17. Does this benefit justify the cost? For a single patient, the out-of-pocket cost will vary widely, and so this will be individualized. On a systems-wide setting, testing and adjuvant targeted therapy is expensive, and these costs need to come from somewhere. Does this benefit justify the cost to society? A larger question. And is this significant DFS benefit in of itself of sufficient value? If the cost out-of-pocket were low, if the toxicity were minimal to none, would receiving osimertinib just to extend DFS be worth that cost? I think it is reasonable. I think it could be. But I also understand how some people think it would not be. Where there are multiple sets of, I think, valid uh, sets of values, this is the perfect setting, the definition of the need for shared decision-making. Where I should not assume that a patient shares the values I do. We should state this benefit, but be very transparent about what we don't know and allow that patient to make the best decision for them, a decision that may evolve over time. These data will be interesting to closely analyze as the years come. There are many answered questions. One thing is clear, conversation about Adora is just beginning.